I hold in my hand a Wi-Fi router that the United States government claims is being actively exploited by bad actors. Is that true? And where did this vulnerability data come from? We're gonna answer all those questions and more in this video. My name is Matt Brown and I am a bug bounty hunter. I get paid to find real vulns in devices just like this one and I am a security researcher so I love digging into claims like this and seeing whether they're true. Let's jump into it. And this here is the website of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. They care about security so much, they, they put the name in there twice. So we're going to look at this alert that was sent out by them last month. And it, they claim in this alert that there are two known exploited vulnerabilities. This is not theoretical, they know. These are being exploited out in the wild, as they say. The first one is for some Apple product that we don't care about in this video, and the second is for our TP-Link router. Actually, a number of different routers, and we'll get into that, but that there, the claim is that there's a command injection vulnerability. Command injection is one of the worst kind of vulnerabilities you can have. It lets an attacker execute usually arbitrary commands on the device, oftentimes with elevated privileges, especially in the IoT world where everything runs as root, right? So let's dig into this. We wanna know what, what are the details of this vulnerability? Well, we go over here to the National Vulnerability Database page on these findings. And we see that there are a number of different Wi-Fi routers that are alleged to have this command injection vulnerability. And one of them that I have in my hands is the WR740N version one. That version one refers to the hardware version, not the firmware version, because if we scroll down here, and this is really uh, kind of tedious, but there is no firmware version listed as being vulnerable, which usually means they're claiming that all the firmware versions are vulnerable or that they don't know which ones are vulnerable. And uh, it's probably, probably the latter. And so we're going to dig into some of these links here. So the, the CV database usually doesn't have very much details in the listing itself, and it, has, and it relies on external links to kind of fill in the, the details there. And so here we see that it's already telling us this is a broken link. So spoiler alert, there's nothing here, but that's not true. Uh, so this repository, we can see that the, the actual finding data is not here, but this, this repository still exists. It's just that the TP-Link folder has been removed. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to this later because that's gonna be important when we try to find the origin of like, like where did this all start? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this uh, link here and this is the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive's awesome project where they archive content and so you can kind of go back in time and if something's been deleted or changed, you can see that. And so luckily somebody uh, archived this page and so we can go back in time and look at what used to be in this GitHub repository on this specific vulnerability. And so uh, we, 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 we see a lot of information in this write-up. We're not gonna read all that in this video. Uh, the key thing here is that a uh, the exploit effect is a denial of service and remote code execution. So we're gonna we're gonna dig into that a little bit. Uh, and then uh, obviously a command injection is being alleged. There's a bunch of POCs. We're gonna go back up to that. But I want to start here. So the vulnerability principle section. Um, it, it, I, we're we're gonna give grace to this person. And by the way, my criticism here is on the United States government's agency for rehashing this vulnerability and saying that it's being exploited. It's not on the individual that posted this here. So uh, let's lay the blame at the right feet here. So uh, they're claiming that, that this path, this user RPM, WLAN network RPM component has a command injection vulnerability. So down here, it says, there's a command injection vulnerability. What is a command injection vulnerability? That's usually when you can trick a web application or some or any system into executing what should be data as code and in the context of a shell, right? So here I have a Linux shell and 
if a command were to get passed through to here and somebody were to, you know, run the, uh, the, the hostname command, uh, well, there's no hostname command on my computer because, you know, it's Arch. Uh, you run ID, you can see all the groups that I'm in, right? That's usually a good way to prove that, that what user you're being ex you're executing as. So, uh, but this is a command injection vulnerability. It lets you, lets you execute all these low-level commands on the shell of the target device. That's pretty serious. Now, what's interesting here in the write-up is that they also have a bunch of stuff. They say this SSID one parameter key was put into the stack without being checked, resulting in denial of service. That sounds like language from a buffer overflow exploit. Why is that? Why is that here? Why is that in a command injection finding? You don't commit. You don't care about the stack and the heap when you're doing a command injection. Usually, most of the time, caveats, all that stuff. Uh, and so let's let's look at the proof of concept. Let's look at, at the actual exploit and try to reproduce it. We're gonna we're gonna plug this device in in a minute. We're gonna actually try to run this exploit against the real device. And so here we can see uh, that they have this funky path up here. I don't know don't know why that's there, but it's uh, the the correct path is you know user RPM. WLAN, network RPM, and then right here in this SSID1 parameter, we can see that they are attempting to perform a command injection attack because they have some, some text, some normal text, and then two pipe symbols, which in a command execution environment is usually going to kind of, uh, kind of trim off whatever is in front and say, okay, now we're, now we're gonna run another command. And so uh, then, it would, then it would run that other command. Another way to do it, in this next example here is just to do is just to separate everything out with semicolons to put semicolon and then reboot your command that you're trying to execute and then another semicolon and in the other one here we have just you know the, the text a in front of the semicolon and no trailing semicolon so it seems like they were trying to do a lot of different things on on a lot of different firmwares so here we see uh we see a semicolon and a sem and a trailing semicolon. So, so again, trying to you know cut off the data context and execute a fresh command, uh, which, which is in this case is reboot. Let's try it. Let's let's plug in our real device that is alleged to be vulnerable and give it a shot. So over here on my desk, I have a simple USB to Ethernet adapter that we're going to plug into the LAN interface on this device. And then we're going to power on. We're just going to plug in power. And then we can see all sorts of blinking lights on the front there. And so let's go over and get this shell ready. I'm going to verify I've already kind of set up the, the network here or at least I think so. Let's check. Let it come online here. Ha ha. Okay, I, I, I did not configure the IP address. I'm actually gonna statically assign an IP address and that's just gonna avoid a bunch of stuff getting messed up. So I can ping the device and it is now online. It's finally booted up. And over here, we're going to hit refresh and we are on our routers page, our, our routers administration page. We've already logged in, and so it's it's doing basic authentication, and so it's remembered our credentials. It's not like unauthenticated. You have to authenticate. Like an attacker would have to like to get to this page and to perform what we're going to attempt to perform, they would need the username and password, which the defaults are admin admin, and who actually changes those, but just saying. So we're gonna go to wireless. And then here on this page, you can see currently our SSID is hello world. Well, let's, let's change that to hello world one and hit save. Now, I am proxying all the web traffic in my web browser here to Kaido, which is an HTTP proxy. And this is going to allow us to see all of the traffic that is going between my web browser and our router over here. And so we can see all of these HTTP requests over in this pane in, in this pane and the responses over here, which is kind of blocked by my face, but we don't need to worry about that right now. 
Um, and we don't need to worry about it because what we really care about is the request because if it actually executes a command, uh, a command execution, then we're not gonna get a response over here, right? Like usually you don't get a response. So what we got is we have that request. So we, we, we found it already. Okay, so user RPM, WLAN network RPM, and right here we see that parameter, that SSID one parameter, and we see that it is getting set to hello world one. Whatever we typed into this interface, when we hit save, it sent this request. And so right here, we wanna modify this and try to do our command injection. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna right click uh, really anywhere in this request, and we're gonna say send to replay, and then we're gonna say default collection, and then we're gonna go here, and we're going to see our request right here, and now it's in a place where we can modify it and we can attempt to resend it over and over again. And so we can go hello world, instead of hello world, we can say a semicolon reboot. We can do that and it, 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 it doesn't reboot. We can put another semicolon at the end there. Doesn't reboot. We can do the pipe symbols. Doesn't reboot. We can do that without the semicolon. You guessed it, it still doesn't reboot. We can just do the leading. As you can see, this vulnerability does not work on the real device. You notice I've said that word real a couple times. That's because if we go back here and we look at this write-up, we can see that they are using the Firmware Analysis Toolkit. This is an emulator. So they have most likely obtained the firmware from TP-Link's website, which you can go, you can just go there and download the, the firmware for free and grab the firmware file. You can unpack it and you can pop it into one of these emulators. A lot of people ask me in my videos why I don't do a lot of emulation. And the reason is, is because you can usually get something to work in the emulator, you know, like 80% of the way, 90% of the way, but getting everything to work just right is very hard. And there's, and there's diminishing returns and after some amount of effort, I would have been better off to just grab a real device and try an exploit or try a set of attacks against the real thing than to spend all this time working on an emulator. And one of the problems with an emulator is sometimes it'll like, you'll get the web page working, it'll emulate the web server and you'll get the web page, but then it'll crash, okay? And I think that that's what's going on here. So you can see their process of, you know, okay, they, 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 they get the web page to load with the emulator and then after sending the POC, the target system did not verify the input. Again, we have this language about buffer overflow that doesn't even belong here. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but here is the proof that the command injection worked. It's just that the device rebooted, right? But the device could reboot for all sorts of reasons. There could be a watchdog functionality that detects that the web server crashes and it could automatically reboot the system. There's a number of reasons why a device might reboot. Um, one theory that I have on that that's kind of interesting is potentially when they were doing their command injection, if we go back here to the web interface, uh, I really increase this font size here, you'll see down here it says that the change of the wireless config will not take effect until the router reboots, please click here. And if you click here, you can it, really small, in really small text down there in the bottom, you can see that the endpoint that gets called is slash user RPM slash sys reboot RPM. So like that is going to be a command that is going to intentionally reboot the device. So maybe the security researcher in this case clicked, clicked that button and confused it with uh, the command injection attack. Who knows? But let's go back. Because I, I, I said that there's all this language here that seems to be maybe copied and pasted, copied and pasted from a buffer overflow finding. So we go back to the original repository here. Now, one side quest here is that there is one issue reported here, and my Mandarin is not that great, but my Google Translate is, and this one issue states, why were all the vulnerability details <laughs> deleted? <laughs> That's awesome. So. Uh, valid, va very valid question, uh, random person, 
Uh, I'm sure you had good intentions by asking this and wanting to know the vulnerability details in, in Mandarin. So, uh, but we have this D-Link folder. And in this D-Link folder, there are eight vulnerabilities that this, uh, this researcher found. And so we're just going to take a look at some of them. We'll just do one, two, and seven, and eight. And so here we see a, a buffer overflow finding. And so what they did is if we scroll down, they use the firmware analysis toolkit again. They use the emulator again. I don't believe in any of these findings. They were ever tested against a real device. And when you do that, you can make a lot of assumptions about what is happening in the emulator. And you, like, you can assume that things that happen in the emulator will happen in the real device, and they won't. It, it, it just won't because the hardware is different, because you're, you're kind of nopping out, you're kind of making certain things inert in order to make them not crash in the emulator, and they will act differently on a real, on a real device, on a real piece of hardware. And so uh, here again, we can see they're running the device in an emulator, and they sent a very long string of text in the SSID field and they caused it to crash. Well, it could, well, in an emulator, it could crash for all sorts of reasons. And so if we just look through here, we can see that again and again. Here's another buffer overflow and uh, it's the same thing. Now, I, I wanna note here that we see that same language, the something parameter key can be of arbitrary length and is placed on the stack without proper validation. So we go to our Wayback Machine finding, and we we remember that you know it's it's more or less the same kind of wording. The something key was put onto the stack without being checked. So it's like basically the same wording. And so I think what happened here is that somebody was. I, I don't think this person's acting in bad faith that reported these CVEs. I think that they were probably taking a training, right? This, this, uh, this firmware analysis toolkit, you can see it's uh, part of a training that's offered by Adify. Adify does great IoT security and hacking training. And I think that they just started loading stuff up in an emulator because that's what they learned to do in their class. And things, uh, things happened and they thought they were vulnerabilities. And maybe some of these are vulnerabilities, just to be clear. But my analysis is only on this one CVE because that's the only real piece of hardware that I have to test on. And that is why testing on real hardware is important. And if we go back to it, it's why the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, the United States government, should not be putting, uh, you know, putting out these, these alerts unless they have done this verification unless they understand the vulnerability. So something that I thought was really interesting, if you go to their about page, their mission, the mission of CISA, which is what they're called because it's a mouthful, um, is we lead the national effort to understand. The first word there is to understand, to understand, manage, reduce risk in our cyber and physical infrastructure. So, to understand a vulnerability, you need to do your due diligence. You need to verify. And when you verify, use a real device if it's, if it's in an IoT target. Don't rely on an emulator. Don't rely on secondhand research. It's sometimes not reliable. You need to verify this stuff. So uh, thank you for watching this video. If you want to support the channel, definitely hit the subscribe button and check out in the description my newsletter that has been kicking off. That's where I share kind of hot takes like this. I share my opinions and the IoT security landscape in the news, educational resources, what's good, what's bad. Uh, you get my completely uncensored take, so definitely check that out. Thank you for watching, and as always, have a good day.